tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Garen felt his face split into a broad grin involuntarily as he took the keys from the dealer. It had been a moment he had dreamed of for quite a long time, and at last, there it was. Climbing into the long-retired city shuttle bus, the reality that it would be not only his new vehicle, but home as well, settled in his mind, both thrilling and anxiously. Had he made a terrible mistake? Was he up to the life of a nomad? One who roams freely with no final destination in mind and wears the wind in their clothes. Was this not an insane decision on his part? After all, he had no idea what he was doing under the hood. To say Garen's mechanical know-how was minimal would be a gross understatement. His training and education was more of the liberal arts variety with a focus on writing. Little of this translated well to understanding things such as tie rods, tailpipes, drive trains, or electrical systems. To compound this, his transition from living in a cramped apartment to an even more cramped space within a bus was slightly more than halfway inspired by the increasingly extortionate rents that, according to his previous landlord, and seemingly every other rental property deemed to be spurned by market demands rather than the more obvious greed that had become the central mantra of the property management and rental industry. Though he had dreamed of living a nomadic life of creation and improvisation for years, he couldn't help but feel as though he was more thrust into such than truly choosing it. As he turned the key to start up the large diesel engine that powered his new abode, he was at first taken aback when a warning light flashed on his dash console. Was this some engine failure light he had failed to notice during his driving test? Was this a lemon? He knew so little and was rapidly learning that this new life demanded very much. However, as he read the light, he saw it was merely a warning to avoid starting the engine too quickly as the words do not start engine disappeared. Of course, he thought. Diesels were a thing of process, requiring just a moment for their engines to prepare to turn over. He had waited this long to sit in this seat at last, so another moment was hardly a bother. As the massive engine let out a roar upon awakening, Garen suddenly felt even more excited as the whole affair, as real as it clearly was, was suddenly even more of a tangible reality. Within a few weeks' time, he would have the remaining packed belongings he owned moved from the overpriced apartment he had rented and into his new home on wheels. Though a considerable amount of work lay ahead of him in regards to building an actual home, he was pleased that at least the old decals had been mostly removed, ensuring he'd not be mistaken for an actual shuttle bus, having strangers board his home before realizing their mistake. The seats, handrails, and even the fare box, which sat just before the side passenger door, would be easy enough to remove. Once that was completed, there would only be the more daunting tasks, such as putting in a new floor, insulation, having the wiring redone for a more residential purpose, none of which he was properly qualified or knowledgeable about how to do but all of which he maintained a sincere faith he would learn along the way. His future travels, despite the regular daydreams of a nomadic life, were far from the romantic act of liberation as described in the works such as Walden, or more modernly into the wild. In anything, it could be said that such was almost an act of desperation amidst an increasing unaffordable cost of living, as well as a perpetual sense of listless purposelessness that had increasingly dogged him over recent years following the gradual decline in his career prospects. 
Though the thought of downsizing, decluttering, and escaping the mundane grind of the day-to-day -day world of work, eat, repeat was undeniably appealing, it felt to be poetic logic to address a sense of personal aimlessness with actual aimless wandering. This isn't to say that Garen was depressed, as much as ambivalent about life in general. As a boy, he'd always dreamed of discovering some grand purpose and destiny, though as his mid-thirties gave way to his late thirties, it seemed to be apparent that either he missed his calling or that none existed to begin with. The desire for happiness dulled over time into a desire merely for contentedness, which in time itself gave way to an overall sense of predictable and empty staleness. Shifting the bus into drive, Garen at first pressed down on the accelerator gently, before finding such to next to nothing save for making noise. Having never driven so large or so heavy a vehicle, it took him a hesitant second to push down harder, finding the sweet spot at roughly halfway to the floor. With a grumbling roar, the bus lurched forward along the dealership yard and towards the road. Pulling on to the rural highway the lot was located just off of, he pressed down harder, feeling the torque rise higher and higher until the pedal hit the floor. Though he only managed to get the bus up to 30 miles per hour at first, between the nerves of driving such a large machine for the first time and the different scale and perspective from the higher driver's seat caused him to feel as though he was barreling along at a considerably faster pace. He smiled as he felt the turbo kick in, affording an extra bump of acceleration, bringing him quickly up to fifty, a comfortable cruising speed. The plan was to drive the beast back to his soon-to-be former apartment complex, before bringing it to the rented garage he planned to build in. However, now on the road, he found that he couldn't help but want to keep going. Every mile led to another, and then another. Soon the light of day had faded and the needle on his fuel gauge had come to lay nearly flat and empty. Though he knew little of diesel engines, he had learned from forums and YouTube videos that one ought never to let the tank run dry, lest they be required to go through all manner of hassle to get the engine running again. As he glanced at the time as displayed on the stereo and the dash, he was surprised to see he had been driving for several hours. So much for a quick dash down some backcountry roads to run the rig in and then return to his place. He rubbed his eyes, noticing he was more tired than he had thought. Down the road, and just around the next bend, he spied the familiar shining lights of an upcoming gas station. He had enjoyed his drive, but the sun had set and fatigue had begun to set in. It was then he decided he would stop off, gas up, perhaps grab a thick and bitter truck stop coffee, as he would likely need to get used to such as long as travels to come, and then head back to turn in for the night. Rounding the bend after a few more moments, the bright and garish lights of a country highway truck stop greeted his eyes. It seemed strangely desolate, with the bright white overhead lights shining down onto empty pumps. A handful of delivery trucks sat in a small, darkened row off to the side of the main structure in a darkened parking lot. As Garen pulled in, once the sticker shock of the increasingly absurd fuel prices settled uncomfortably in his mind, he thought for a moment of laying out on either the floor or rear row of seats just to experiment with sleeping in truck stops such as these. Thought quickly escaped, though, as he realized he was still under an hour from his soon-to-be former apartment, and that despite its undoubtedly oily and disgusting texture and flavor, the coffee, if they had any, would at least be caffeinated. As one who was generally sensitive to such, sleep was slightly an irrelevant idea. Garen pulled up to one of the open diesel pumps and, shutting the bus off, felt enveloped slightly by the silence that fell as the engine went cold. So many hours of rumbles, roars, and vibrations along the road had allowed him to get so used to such that silence and stillness was almost overwhelming. He quickly popped out of the cab and made his way towards the brightly lit shop. 
He could see on his approach that the place was all but empty, save for the bored-looking clerk at this counter and a single old man seated on a bench just outside the door. He was a wizened-looking man of indeterminate but old age, with a mess of long white hair and a long grey beard which, as he sat, rested nearly on his lap. While sitting, he still leaned somewhat on a black cane, capped with a silver crow's head as a handle, his back arched with a slight hunch to it. The old man smiled and nodded his head cordially as Garen approached. He responded in kind before slipping through the front door of the shop and making a beeline towards the coffee stand. It was lackluster, as he'd imagined, pouring almost like oil more than coffee into the medium-sized paper cup, which bore an image of a smiling sun, the coffee station's logo and mascot, which gazed and grinned in a way that was more unnerving than charming. A frantic, bug-eyed visage, with a grin which would go ear to ear had the character any ears to speak of. Garen would often wonder who the people who made such strange marketing decisions were in cases like these, and how they kept their jobs when clearly they weren't up to the task. I could probably do that job, he thought to himself. He had throughout his life always had an artistic splash to him. A reasonably good illustrator, he had even for a short time studied graphic design during his short tenure at a local community college years ago. That ambition he found, like most others, failed to truly grab or inspire him once he learned the doldrums of it and got a small taste of what such a career would be like. Still, however, he would often find that side of him emerging, usually at the sight of some strange or poorly crafted piece of art or marketing material. Approaching the counter, where a short, dull-eyed, clearly bored clerk awaited, he pondered what he would choose for the coffee station mascot. Clearly not the sun. The sun is hot, and hot days are hardly the best time for hot coffee. Perhaps a bean or several beans. A bean band, all with cartoon arms and legs, smiles that convey joy instead of instability and eyes less terrifyingly manic. Like the California raisins, only with beans. As the clerk dully looked up to his customer from his phone, Garen placed the coffee down on the counter and withdrew his wallet. He didn't even bother to put the device down. On the screen, Garen could see the colorful lights of some random matching-type mobile game. Two fifty, the clerk muttered, lazily punching at the service terminal screen with his finger in an act that was clearly automatic to him at this point, while barely even glancing at Garen. Garen handed the clerk three dollars and accepted the two quarters with a smile. The expression was not reciprocated. Instead, in a bored and equally automatic voice, the young man simply muttered, Have a good night, before returning to his game. Walking out, he wondered if that desperately bored clerk shared his general malaise when it came to a sense or notion of purpose. Surely this was not a career he had plans to stick with. It must, of course, be some sort of stopgap job to keep him afloat till he found a true calling of some kind. Or was it? Behind the obvious ennui, could there be a zen-like contentedness Garen simply couldn't recognize? Perhaps the clerk valued simplicity and routine, allowing purpose to be derived simply from the act of fulfilling his station. Perhaps he was happy in the way Camus asks the world to consider Sisyphus to be as he forever rolls his boulder up his hill. Garen continued pondering this question during the brief few steps he took before finding himself outside again. Good evening, young man, the old man on the bench said cheerily. It took him somewhat by surprise, as in his philosophical ponderings he had all but forgotten about the man just outside. Garen instantly found the man inexplicably likable, beyond the mere cheerfulness to his casual greeting. It was an odd sense, not unpleasant, but strange all the same in its intensity. 
The notion passed in less than a moment as he quite immediately smiled back in return. Certainly is, sir. Hope yours is going well. He replied. Just fine, just fine. Nearing its end, I'd say. The old man followed up with. At a glance, Garen found himself thinking the man looked somewhere between an impoverished pensioner and a wizard. He would not, if asked, be able to explain exactly why this was the impression he got from the sight of the old stranger, but he would likely assure any who did ask that they would agree with him completely on it. He was dressed in somewhat baggy clothes, an old flannel shirt with well-worn jeans and black suspenders. Upon his feet were not shoes, but leather sandals that looked themselves to be very old as well. His beard was a wiry mix of white and grey, frizzled and somewhat wild, bordering on unkempt. However, it was his eyes that struck Garen the most. Deep set, broad, and of a striking blue. Though his posture, his clothing, and the general expression on his face all portrayed a somewhat tired old man, in his eyes a sharpness and intensity betrayed this curiously. Me too. The old man peered over towards Garen's bus. Saw you get out of that, he said, gesturing towards him. This is the end of your shift then? Garen laughed slightly. Oh no, I'm not a bus driver. Well, I am sort of now in that I drive a bus, but no, it's not my job or anything. I just bought that today. Oh, okay, interesting, the man replied. Might I ask what you plan to do with it? Um, sure. Well, this might sound a little strange, but I'm actually planning on turning it into a kind of camper home, Garen replied. It still felt a little awkward explaining his plan as many around him for the mo several months he'd been planning it would often look at him as though he was a crazy person. Really now? You want to do some traveling? That's my thinking, yeah. Maybe go see the desert. I've never been there. Here it's beautiful. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Personally, I've always stayed close to the water myself. Used to work on the water, actually. The old man replied with something of a nostalgic expression briefly crossing his face as he did so. And no kidding. Were you a sailor? No, not quite. I ran a ferry. That for a very long time. Actually, just retired, the man replied, the nostalgia being subtly swept away by a sudden look of comfort. Well, congratulations on your retirement. What do you think you'll do now that you're not running your ferry? asked Garen. The man paused and looked off into the dark beyond the gas pumps and station lot. He sighed a sigh of comfort as though great weight had been lifted from him upon the asking of the question. I suppose I'll simply move on myself. Something tells me you've got a kind of a similar idea. Nothing much for you where you're at, right? Garen nodded. Good a time as any to move on to something new then, the man continued. That's the plan. The old man nodded back and paused, again looking out into the darkness. I know we've only just met, and I'm just a stranger at a gas station, but I was wondering if I might ask a small favor of you. It's a small thing, but would be of great help, he said, returning his gaze to Garen. Garen wasn't sure how to respond. Though he was rather eager to gas up and head home, something in him felt oddly compelled to agree to help the man, regardless of what he asked. Shrugging, Garen nodded. Sure. What do you need? Could you help me with a short ride home? It's not far. Just down the road and across the river. 
I'd walk with these old legs of mine on what they used to be, and the only bridge to cross doesn't allow pedestrian traffic. I don't mean to put you out at all, but it would be just such a great help. Uh, Garen began, slightly confused by the question. It was not the request itself which was strange to him, as he again felt oddly compelled to help. But for the sake of being helpful to what was a friendly and somewhat charming stranger, as well as a strangely involuntary desire to say yes. But rather than knowing very recently well, he was not aware of any rivers in the immediate area. Across the river? How far are we talking? Just a few miles up the road, and then you take a ride onto the bridge. It's not far, the old man replied, gesturing lazily up the road. I can pay you. Thinking it over, he still couldn't place what river the old man was talking about. He wondered for a moment if perhaps he wasn't having a senior moment, but between the look in his eye and the confidence in his voice, something told him... He had his wits fully about him. Perhaps, Garen wondered, there was some small river or stream in the area he just never knew about or never noticed. Regardless, the notion of leaving this little old man out in the middle of nowhere felt to be something he simply couldn't bring himself to do. It was in that moment that the question as to how he got there and what he was doing there crossed his mind. Though only briefly, as the compulsion to be of service once again overtook him. You know what? Yeah. I'll give you a lift. Keep your money. Come on along, said Garen. A curious sense of almost giddiness running through his head at the prospect of driving his first passenger. No, no. I insist. The old man replied, rising from his seat and reaching into his pocket. He was surprisingly taller than Garen had expected, standing perhaps an inch or so taller than he. From his pocket, the man pulled fifty cents. Two quarters. Garen's brow furrowed, and a little smile of amusement crossed his face. Well, okay then, he said with a chuckle. By the way, I didn't get your name. Oh, you can call me Charlie, the man replied. Nice to meet you, Charlie. I'm Garen. Garen. It's not a name I think I've come across too often. Can't say I've ever met another one myself, Garen replied, with yet a chuckle. There was something strange to this interaction that he couldn't put his finger on. It felt odd. Different than most meetings with most any other stranger. There was something to it that just felt correct like a puzzle piece falling into place. He felt oddly dazed, as though he had just woken up from a dream. His thoughts scattered in his mind a moment before a singular sense of clarity overtook him. He had a passenger to transport. Though he didn't specifically know where he was headed, an irresistible impulse to board his bus and begin his supposedly short drive welled within his mind. Though he didn't know the exact location, something within him, seemed to be guiding him. He and old Charlie made their way to the small shuttle bus parked at the pump. Charlie's gait was somewhere between a labored shuffle and a casual saunter, and a sly sort of smile crossed his face. The slight hunch in his back and his seemingly pained posture did cause him to move slowly, though Garen wasn't bothered. Managing to gain several paces ahead of the slow-moving old man, he quickly slipped in through the driver's side door to his seat and, reaching over, pulled the lever to open the passenger's entrance. Just as it opened, old Charlie arrived at the entrance, his grin widening as he stepped aboard. Reaching out with a chuckle, he deposited the two quarters into the fare box which greeted him as he entered. There we go, young man. The fare is paid, <laughs> he said with his chortle continuing as he sat down. Pushing the lever back and closing the door once more as old Charlie took a seat, Garen slipped his key into the ignition, 
paused a moment to allow the engine to prepare itself, and then, with the same low roar as before, started the diesel engine up and shifted the bus into drive. A moment later, they took off, slowly pulling back onto the road and then driving off into the dark of night. After rounding a curve, the light of the gas station faded behind them, leaving only Garen's headlights and the bright full moon above to illuminate the road before them. So, here we are. I could see a lot of potential with this thing. Planning on building one of those uh, tiny houses in here? Charlie asked through his grin. Yeah, that's the plan, Garen said as he kept his eyes peeled on the road. As the words left his lips, however, a curious sense of what could almost be described as doubt crossed his mind. Was he going to make a house out of his bus? Or should he maybe keep it as is? But what sense would that make? Or at least that was the plan. Got yourself a new idea then, Charlie replied. I, um, well, no, not exactly, but... Garen was suddenly very confused. His plan had been his plan and his only plan since first he thought of buying the bus. Now, though, he found himself feeling as though he'd already committed to a new and different plan, although what it was, he could not say. Huh. That's weird. What is? Old Charlie asked. Well, it's like that was my plan. Now I feel like I had a different one, and I just... I can't remember what it is. Ah, you're probably just tired, Charlie responded with a light wave of his hand. It gets easy to get confused when you're tired and have been on the river for too long. On the river? Garen asked, utterly baffled. Did I say on the river? <laughs> Charlie laughed. I'm sorry, I went on the road. It's easy to get confused when you're tired and have been on the road for too long. Maybe I've been on the road for too long. Well, I hope not. We've only gone... Garen stopped mid-sentence as he looked down to his gauges. He was struck by two realizations. The first was that somehow he had entirely forgotten to fuel up while at the station. Regardless of this, however, the fuel gauge read as full in spite of it having been near empty when he'd arrived and in spite of him having pumped no fuel. The second was that his odometer for some reason was reading zero miles, both for the trip and grand total. None of this made any sense to Garen as he tried to reason and rationalize the clearly impossible. Stranger still, though, the more he thought about how wholly strange and impossible such a situation was, the more reasonable and sensible it became. Of course his tank was full. His tank was always full. And of course he had driven zero miles, as miles meant nothing on a drive like this. We haven't far to go, Charlie said, interrupting Garen's internal interrogation of the situation. Curiously, though, he'd never been where they were headed, and was still certain there were no rivers for miles, he knew intrinsically that Charlie was right. They didn't have far to go, and the closer they got to their destination, the more familiar Garen felt with this route. Every passing moment, the drive felt more like one he'd made thousands of times. So, what is it you hope to find out on the road, Garen? You know, I don't really know. I guess I'm hoping to find something real out there. Something with... I don't know. Something with meaning, maybe? Charlie interjected. Garen nodded. Yeah. Yeah, something meaningful. Like something I can call my own. A chance to live for something more than just paying next month's rent, you know? Escaping the humdrum, huh? Well, I guess that makes sense. You know, 
Most people have that urge within them, though typically they tend not to notice or really understand it. It's sort of a universal existential crisis. Everyone wants to live meaningfully and do something of real value to the world seldom feel that beyond a sort of empty confusion. They know they want something else, to be or do something important, but they just can't put their finger on it. It's a tragedy, really. Did you ever find it yourself? Garen asked over his shoulder. Charlie smiled and nodded slowly. I most certainly did. It came at a cost, but all in all, it was well worth it. What was the cost? Well, I never had a family. I always thought when I was younger that it was something I'd want later in life, but my work was a bit too demanding for that to work out. Do you think it was worth it? Asked Garen. Absolutely. You might not think running a ferry is all that important, but people have places they need to go and need someone to take them there. That was my purpose, and I like to think I did a good job, Charlie said, his smile broadening as the obvious sense of pride within him swelled. I don't think I ever want kids. Charlie eyed him curiously as he drove. No? Nah. There are too many people on the planet as it is. Besides, I don't think whatever kind of road life I find would really work for a family. Kind of like you. I can respect that. We should be getting close now. Yep, we are. Garen replied. Pausing a moment as he actively wondered how he knew that. And how many stops do we have before we arrive? Charlie asked, phrasing it almost more like a rhetorical question than a genuine inquiry. First one's just around the next bend, said Garen, now even more confused as to where this knowledge was coming from. Charlie simply nodded his smile still broad and his eyes shining with unspoken understanding. The two rode in silence for another few minutes, Charlie sparing more gnawing glances at Garen, who furrowed his brow trying to determine how he knew what came next. As they rounded a bend in the road, Garen saw the first and only street light there was to be seen along their journey. It looked oddly out of place and familiar in a way he couldn't fully discern. Beneath the light, right along the roadside, stood a small child, a young girl, who appeared to be waiting for the bus. She looked to be about ten or so years of age. Garen was baffled as to what this child was doing so far out in the middle of nowhere, yet at the same time he was neither surprised to see her nor confused as to what he was supposed to do. Garen brought the bus to a stop the young girl standing just outside the passenger door. She stepped forward as he pulled the handle for the lever mechanism, causing the two glass doors to swing open. Silently, the young girl stepped aboard the bus and approached him, extending her arm. Garen instinctively gestured to the fare box, and the girl dropped two quarters into it. The fare was paid. The girl took a seat a couple seats down from Charlie, who smiled warmly at her. Hello there, he said to her. Hello, I'm Courtney. What's your name? She replied cheerily. I'm Charlie. This is Garen. Hi, Garen, Courtney said, looking to her driver. Garen looked up into the mirror and gave Courtney a nod. He wasn't immediately sure why, but he found himself feeling bad for the girl as though some tragedy had befallen her, the details of which he did not yet know. Except he did. The mere act of thinking about the impression he had taken seemed to have opened something in his mind. 
The girl's entire life story lingered in his memory as though he had been there the entire time. From her birth, which she herself naturally didn't remember, up through her first day of school, birthdays, Christmases, the birth of her little brother Ronnie, all of it. Um, Mr. Charlie? She asked in a small voice, her expression suddenly turning to a mix of fear and confusion. Where are my mom and dad? I was just with them. Then I was here. Do you know where they are? Charlie replied to her with a look of sympathy and understanding. They'll be along soon. Don't you worry about a thing, he said, extending his arm across the vacant seat to offer her a reassuring pat on the shoulder. Will they meet us where we're going? The young girl asked. In time, eventually. Yes, they will. You will see them again, said Charlie, still gazing sympathetically at the girl. I hope they're not worried. One time, when we went to Disney World, I got lost and was really scared. But then Cinderella and a policeman helped me. My mom was so scared. She was crying, and then I started crying, and I felt so bad for getting lost. Do you think my mom is crying now? The question stabbed Garen in the heart as though it were a blade. A pang of sincere sadness fell upon him as he heard the worry in her voice. He would undoubtedly break her heart to learn the truth, which she would soon enough. Hopefully she would find comfort after they arrived. Glancing back again in his mirror, he could see that somehow Charlie's kindness seemed to put the girl at ease instantly. He found this calming charm of his to be fascinating, though somewhere within him, he knew somehow it was more than just a simple matter of being good with frightened children. It was beyond just a skill, but something more. Before he could think any deeper on the matter, however, a strange sensation came over him, feeling like a mix of procedure and anticipation. Striking him at the same time as this odd, almost prescient sense, he also couldn't help but notice that Charlie seemed to look different. He sat more upright than he had before, his posture more square yet comfortable. The cane he had been leaning on, even while sitting, was now laid against the seat beside him. His icy blue eyes still had the same intensity, but seemed somehow less deep-set and hawkish. And strangest of all was his beard. While before it was a stringy and unkempt rat's nest of white and gray hairs, it was now seemingly shorter and more of a salt and pepper gray than the white of a man in his seventies or eighties. In general, he looked, for lack of a better term, younger. Garen, Charlie said from behind him, I believe you have another passenger coming up. He didn't need to be told. He knew. Just as he knew, there was at least one more after that before they reached the bridge. Sure enough, perhaps a half mile down the pitch black road, stood another street lamp in the midst of absolute darkness. Below the light, as before, Garen could make out a figure standing, waiting, waiting for him. As before, the bus slowed to a stop, the passenger side doors lining up with a waiting man, who upon boarding extended his hand, dropping fifty cents into the bus's fare box. Garen pulled the door lever and closed the bus up once more as the man, a young and thin man with a goatee and unkempt shoulder-length hair, took a seat opposite Charlie, who shot him an empathetic look. Wouldn't have guessed it'd be like one of these. <laughs> Funny how things work, the man said, almost to himself with something of a dark chuckle bookending his musing. He was young, somewhere in his mid-twenties. As Garen looked upon him, he realized immediately that he was in fact twenty-six and ten days old. His name was Dan, and he had struggled for many years with an addiction to opioids. He played the bass guitar in a band and had dreams of making a living as a gigging musician. 
Rock stardom would have been fine, but it was not the goal. The music was the goal, as he would often bark at his bandmates in many an argument over the focus of their project. So you must know where we're heading then? Charlie asked, eyeing the man curiously. <laughs> know where I'm going, at least. Just... Didn't think this would be how I got there, the man replied. What's his name, stranger? I'm Dan. Well, nice to meet you, Dan. I'm Charlie. This is Courtney. And our driver up there is Garen. Charlie replied, gesturing around as he gave introductions. Hi, Dan, said Courtney. Um, hello, everyone, Dan replied, as he looked at the young girl across the aisle from him. A pained and saddened look fell across his face. Without saying anything, he looked at Charlie, almost pleadingly. Charlie merely nodded with a grim expression. Happens to everyone, eventually. What was it for you? Dan asked. I'm just retiring, is all. I'm one of those lucky few who get to choose. Well, technically I did too, replied Dan. Yes, I suppose you did, didn't you? Um, excuse me, but what did you get to choose? Courtney asked in a small voice. Charlie turned to her, offering her another reassuring smile. Don't worry. It'll come to you. Eventually. From the driver's seat, Garen listened closely to the conversation. Despite the vagueness to their discussion, something deep within him perfectly understood what they were talking about, despite his conscious mind not quite being able yet to grasp it. It was as though an obvious truth that he already knew was veiled and concealed from his active thoughts in a manner which he knew would not last long. Their trip was almost over with one, no, two more stops along the way before they reached the bridge. Looking to his instrument panel along the dash, he noted the fuel gauge remained at full regardless of the now difficult to discern length of time they had been driving. Time seemed itself to be losing form and meaning. Checking the digital clock which displayed upon the stereo face, he noticed that it simply blinked twelve o'clock, as though the power had gone out and the clock needed to be reset. However, it didn't need to be reset, and he knew that, somehow. Garen, said Charlie, how about some music? Sure thing. Garen replied, his mind now focusing on the inner sense of the next forthcoming passenger. If asked, he would not be able to adequately describe the feeling with words. However, it felt as if the road from here to there was speaking to him through raw concept and sensation, guiding him onto a place he felt an irresistible compulsion to get to. With a push of a button, he turned on the radio and at a low, soft volume, comfortably numb by Pink Floyd, began playing throughout the bus. Oh, hell yeah. I love this song, Dan said as the music came on. So do I, replied Charlie with a grin. You know, I met Sid Barrett once. Dan chuckled with a snort. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did. What was he like? Really nice guy, actually. A bit out there, but a oh, lifetime of rock and roll and LSD will do that to you. Who is Sid Barrett? Courtney asked. Dan laughed a bit harder at this. <laughs> Only one of the greatest rockers of all time. He sang in a band called Pink Floyd back in the day. They're one of the most iconic bands ever. I'm sure you'll love them when you... Dan trailed off as a grim and sad look crossed his face. You would probably love them, Courtney. They aren't like one of those bands that screams really loud, are they? My uncle listens to that kind of music and I think it's scary, she replied. 
No, that's metal. I like metal, actually. But no, Pink Floyd played music that felt like dreams do. This is them now. Have you ever heard this song? From the bus speakers, the main chorus sang out in a low volume. And I've become comfortably numb. Courtney listened closely, furrowing her little brow as though trying to determine if she remembered it in any way. As the final word numb was sang, her expression lightened and her eyes took on an almost excited look. Yeah, I have heard this before. I think my dad would play it sometimes. He really likes that old people music. Old people music, Dan exclaimed with a mix of mirth and disbelief. Pink Floyd is for everyone. Pink Floyd, my young friend, is forever. Old people music. What do you listen to, huh? He smiled warmly as he challenged the child. Dan had himself been a musician for many years and could never resist the chance to talk about music, especially with kids, as he had always seen it as his duty to introduce the young to the more epic and iconic music of the world. Well, I really like Billie Eilish. She's awesome, the young girl said. Dan paused a moment, thinking... You know, a long time ago, I'd have said, oh, that's just pop music. That's not going to last. But I've got to be honest, she's not bad. Not bad at all. I guess you've got all right taste after all. I just can't believe we lived in a world where people, especially kids, didn't know about Pink Floyd. Then... Have you ever heard of John Lomax? Charlie asked with a sly smile. Dan paused and thought. After a moment, he merely shook his head. No, I haven't. Who was he? You could say he was too early folk music with Floyd was to rock. Time marches on, and eventually everything is forgotten. That's the funny thing about being iconic. It's like immortality. It's the finite nature to it that really gives it meaning, said Charlie in a wizened tone. Dan thought further on this, as did Garen. Huh. You know, I never thought about it like that before. Well, I mean, I guess now is as good a time as any. But that's an interesting thought. Like, eventually... Everyone and everything will be thought of for a last time. And it'll be as though they or it never existed at all. Well, not exactly. But that's the gist of it, I suppose. Things begin and then they end. And things begin again. It's that cycle that keeps things interesting. Charlie watched as Courtney and Dan both pondered this notion, seeming to take some form of comfort in it as their posture and shoulders relaxed, allowing them both to settle more comfortably into their seats. Garen listened silently, only sparing occasional glances into his mirror as a deep sense of responsibility kept his attention fixed firmly to the road ahead of them. This did not stop him from considering that which was said, it was the finite nature to things that gave them meaning, and regardless of whether the time and distance between beginning and end was a thing of a cosmic grandness or even microscopically minuscule, the fact that they happened at all and fulfilled the role the universe had cast them in was in fact what made them matter. Thinking further on this, he realized that on the same token, Purpose was not necessarily derived from will or satisfied desire, but through the fulfillment of a task or function itself. Just as he had opted to take on a life of aimless wandering, hoping to find some direction he might find himself happy with, 
He now felt an almost overwhelming sense of purpose as he had passengers to deliver to their destination. And, if his senses were still in service to this aim, knew that he had one more to pick up just a little ways ahead. Along the drive, the sound of Charlie's voice now caught his attention. He had until that moment spoken in the somewhat hoarse, gravelly tone of an old man. Yet as they spoke, Garen noticed a stronger, almost younger voice coming from the passenger seat behind him. Sparing a glance into the mirror which sat above the driver's seat, he was stunned to see a man of roughly half the age of the Charlie he had set off with. He was clearly still Charlie, but the weathered, wrinkled skin on his hands and face had smoothed. His beard was now more pepper than salt, and seemed to be well trimmed, as though he had just left a barber shop. His sharp, blue eyes glanced back with considerably more spartum. Even his posture was better, as his slight hunch, common among the elderly, was entirely gone. Charlie sat up straight and smiled. What the... Garen muttered to himself. Charlie said nothing, but simply met his gaze in the mirror and smiled, waving his hand in a manner that said, Don't worry about it. Garen knew he'd understand it all soon enough, though there was the matter of this next passenger. As he barreled on through the dark, he could sense the exact location and distance of the next street lamp where his fare awaited. This should be your last fare for the trip. Charlie said, watching Garen closely, ignoring his obvious confusion. He knew it would pass soon enough. I know. One more, and then the bridge, Garen replied, reciting it as established knowledge. Very good, very good, said Charlie, returning his attention to his companions in the back. We're almost there, Dan smirked. Almost wouldn't mind a little longer drive with these tunes playing. As Comfortably Numb came to an end, Dan listened and smiled as he heard the twanging bass lines of Sober from Tool come over the speakers. You like Frozen too? Courtney asked as a smile spread across her face. Dan looked at her curiously, almost laughing at the implication of Tool being on a Disney soundtrack. What do you mean? He looked briefly to Charlie, who simply smirked knowingly. Returning his attention to Courtney, he asked, What song do you hear right now? It's Let It Go. Don't you know this song? She replied. Dan sat and thought a moment, looking again at Charlie, who nodded as the answer came to him. Dan's look of confusion melted away as he mirrored Charlie's knowing smile. Of course. Of course. That makes sense. He laughed to himself another moment, and then turned again to Charlie. So what do you hear? Charlie shrugged. Oh, it's really old and pretty obscure. You've probably never heard of it. Seriously? Dan laughed. You of all people are going straight hipster on me. Charlie shared in his laughter. Have you ever heard the song of Seculos? Well, shit. No. I can't say I have. I guess you've got me there, Dan said, nodding with an exaggerated wave of his hand, admitting his musical defeat. Would you like to? Dan paused a moment. Sure he said with a shrug. Charlie glanced and squinted up at the speakers which sat along the ceiling, as though trying to tune them with his mind. After a moment, the tool track subsided, and an ancient Greek song of love and life began playing for Dan. Though he didn't speak Greek, he could hear the lyrics as they were carved so many thousands of years ago on a funeral pillar by a grieving husband. Dan nodded as he listened, cracking half a smile. Not bad. 
Not bad at all. Courtney, who still heard the infectious lyrics of Let It Go from Frozen playing now on repeat, looked at Charlie with wide and excited eyes. Can I hear the song, Mr. Charlie? Why, absolutely, young lady. It's a very old song. Very, very old. And very beautiful, Charlie replied, beaming at the small girl. As the tune began playing for Courtney, she lit up like a candle, brightly smiling as she listened. It's beautiful, she said almost breathlessly. It is, Charlie agreed. What is it about? Dan, you're a resident music expert. Would you like to tell her? Charlie asked. Dan listened on a bit more and couldn't help but smile as he did. Looking to Courtney, he took a breath, considering the best way to explain it. You can understand the words, right? I can. It's weird. I don't know what the words are, but it's like I know what they mean, she replied. Okay, so what do you think they're about? Courtney listened in silence for a moment, scrunching her face into the sort of face children make when thinking deeply. After a moment of listening, she looked back to Dan. It's like, don't be sad and try to be happy? Yeah, I guess that's fair. It's a little more to it than that, but you're not wrong. Good job, Dan said, nodding almost proudly. Thanks, Courtney replied. Could I listen to my music again, Mr. Charlie? Of course, dear, said Charlie, shooting the same glance as before to the speakers above. Dan? You know, actually, no. I like this. More of this, please. It's soothing. It is indeed. Charlie said through a knowing smirk. Garen could hear all of the songs, all playing simultaneously, yet still in an inexplicably clear manner. It was almost as though they blended together into a hypnotic medley that served as a perfect and nearly ethereal soundtrack for their soon-to-be-completed voyage. He could feel his final fare for the trip close, and soon it would be time to reach the bridge. The three behind him sat and listened to their songs in silence, having come to genuinely enjoy each other's company. Garen kept his eyes peeled for any sign of light along the road ahead of him. Soon, as before, off in the distance, in the low point of a gentle dip in the roadway, he caught sight of the street lamp, and below it, his next fare, waiting patiently. He could see the man's head turn and could feel his eyes lock onto the bus as it drove towards him. Unlike Charlie or Dan, this one didn't quite know what was happening. Or rather, what had happened. Pulling up to the lamp, Garen looked out through the glass passenger doors to see another young man. This one was a black man, as he could sense nineteen years of age. His head was hung low, and Garen could feel a curious sort of sadness that the others didn't seem to share. He didn't know how he could sense such, but it felt too natural to bother questioning. Within the young man's heart, he could feel an intense disappointment. There was a general sadness and regret, as he knew he would need to expect, but in this, there was an added level of a feeling as though the world had let him down in every conceivable way. Opening the door once more, he watched as the young man climbed aboard. He stopped as he reached the top step with a look of slight confusion, looked down to his pocket and reached inside. From it he produced two quarters and, with a confounded expression, automatically deposited the coins into the fare box and took a seat beside Dan. He was dressed in blue jeans and a black hooded sweatshirt. He glanced nervously about as he took his seat, first looking to his right to Dan, who nodded casually. He responded in kind, before looking then to Charlie and then to Courtney, offering them both his silent greeting. 
Charlie nodded back, but Courtney spoke up. Hello, she began. I'm Courtney. This is Charlie, and that is Dan, she said, introducing her companions with a cheery and sunny voice. So, he replied. Um, um, wait, what the fuck? Don't worry, it'll come to you in a moment. Drama can knock your sense of things around a bit, Charlie said knowingly. His name is Thomas. Thomas Jr., but he goes by, Garen began. Call me TJ. Yeah, that's right. I'm TJ, the young man said, cutting Garen off. Where am I? You're on a bus. We don't have long to go, Charlie replied. Where are we going? TJ asked. You'll know in a bit. Don't worry. Do you remember how you got here? Charlie inquired as Garen put the bus back into drive and continued down the dark road. He hadn't noticed it before, but upon reflecting on his night, it occurred to him that as he picked up each passenger... The light they stood beneath went dark as soon as they took off each time. This time, the light had gone out just as TJ had stepped upon the bus. It was beginning to make sense. I was walking home, TJ began slowly. I was at my friend's house, playing Xbox. I got up, got my shit. I was just about to turn onto my street and... He trailed off his gaze drifting upwards and then to the left as he racked his brain for what came next. Yep. And then, Charlie asked, his eyes locked on TJ as he struggled to recall how his night had gone. And then, there were police. Yeah, that's right. Popo rolled up. Started yelling at me. They had the guns out. They... Charlie continued watching TJ work it out with dreadful intensity, seeing him close in on his answer. Dan glanced casually at him, knowing where he was going. Courtney simply listened intently, as though listening to a dark bedtime story. TJ continued. They told me to get on the ground. I told them... I told them I didn't do anything. Then it got real loud. Popman, fuck, those pigs shot me. As the memory of his death came back to him, TJ looked down at his hoodie and saw several holes in the fabric with the entirety of his chest soaked in blood. Lifting the hoodie, his white undershirt was pure crimson with dark patches of deep arterial blood soaking into the fabric. His chest and abdomen were covered in small bloody holes. Fuck! Fucking cops! I wasn't even doing nothing, he said, hanging his head in disappointment. I'm really sorry, TJ, Charlie said, settling into his seat and sighing. It comes for all of us. Yeah, but not for motherfuckers like you, TJ snapped, before looking at Courtney who was clearly terrified at the sight of his bloody body. Shit, I'm sorry, my bad, he said looking to the girl, hoping to assuage her fear over his outburst. That's all right, you were done dirty, young man. You have every right to be angry. Just don't let that consume you when we get where we're going, said Charlie. Yeah, man, I'm sorry for you and yours, Dan chimed in. Thanks, I guess. TJ replied, hanging his head low. How'd you get got? He asked, raising his gaze to meet Dan's. Me? Oh, hot shot of fentanyl. I knew what I was doing. Mine was mostly on purpose, explained Dan. Kind of regretting it, to be honest, but uh, here we are. Motherfuckers shot me for nothing for walking down the fucking sidewalk, TJ said as a flash of rage welled up within him. 
We should play it out different for you, man, Dan offered sympathetically. Me too. Like, what the fuck? I was gonna join the damn Marines. Make something of myself. Get out the trap, you know? Uh, wait, you took yourself out? Dan nodded grimly. Yeah, I'm starting to think that was a mistake. No shit, it was a mistake. Goddamn white boys. I gotta dodge cops who seem being black is a crime and you're just killing yourself because what? You sad? TJ barked, clear and genuine rage in his voice now. You know, I wish I could say it was more than that, but yeah, pretty much. Pretty stupid, huh? Dan replied with a defeated shrug. Fuck it. Don't matter. Life is fucking cheap anyway. What? No. No. Not at all. Charlie chimed in. Then how do you explain this? Homeboy just offed himself because he was a little sad. TJ replied, being suddenly cut off by Dan. Well, hey, Dan interjected. I wasn't just a little sad. I mean, yeah, it was stupid, but it was more than just sad, man. TJ locked eyes with Dan and thought over his point as he looked into his sincere face. Though their circumstances were different, he could somehow feel the dread weight of life Dan had experienced at the end and suddenly understood. He could feel it in what he would at least call his bones, given the circumstances. Shit. Yeah, it was. Sorry, man. I, I didn't mean to, he said, and as the sense of Dan incorporated itself into his mind. No worries, dude. It's fine. Sensing the confusion over the growing, interconnected understanding that his passengers felt, Garen compulsively looked into his mirror and explained with words that simply came to him. We're getting close to our destination. You'll all notice you will feel like you understand one another more and more as we get closer. Don't worry. It's normal. Not knowing where the words came from, Garen suddenly felt more like a tour guide than a bus driver, which in turn he felt more like than a nameless wanderer. There was a purpose to his words, and a purpose to every inch, foot, and mile they traversed. He couldn't define it yet, but he knew it was meaningful and important, and that he had been bestowed a great gift as well as a terrible burden. It's just like... Doesn't it make life feel like cheap like one moment you're living your life with your fam people then tj snapped his fingers it's over like it never mattered to begin with oh it absolutely is not cheap announced charlie with a half laugh (laughs) life life is not cheap dying is cheap dying costs you two coins to do correctly Living, though, its value is incalculable. How so? Firstly, how many people do you think will carry your memory now that you're gone? Responded Charlie. Well, there's my mom's. I know she'll remember me. And? And my brother, my little sis. And there's my friends. We had a tight crew. They won't forget me, TJ said, half to himself and half in response to Charlie's question. And what might they do with that memory? Forget? Oh, hell no. No one's going to forget me. TJ trailed off as the idea settled in his mind more. As it did, his disposition turned again to anger. So you're telling me that the value of a black man's life is that... Of a memory? Is that all we are? Walk down the street and become something for people we love to cry about? Feel angry and powerless? Is that the fucking point? 
His voice raised to a shout as the anger over perceived futility to it all sunk in. Looking to Courtney, TJ saw an abject terror cross her face as tears collected in her eyes. Shit, he said. I'm sorry. No, it's okay, Courtney replied, her fear settling into understanding. I... I think I remember now, too. I was in bed. As she spoke, flashes of a hospital room and her parents standing above her, tears brimming their eyes, and her mother repeatedly covering her eyes and wailing in sadness flooded her mind. It took a moment for all the moments leading to her final one to settle into a discernible story that she could understand. But as it did, Courtney relaxed a bit and then began crying. I died, didn't I? She asked, looking up at Charlie. I'm afraid you did, kid. I'm really sorry, he replied with another pat on her shoulder. Courtney struggled with her tears, snorting and sniffling until finally she was able to speak again. We all died, didn't we? She asked. Dan nodded. Yeah, sadly. All but him, he said, pointing up to Garen, who remained steadfast in his driving duties, eyes peeled to the road ahead of him. Garen thought that he should respond, but remained silent, preferring to listen as he somehow knew how the conversation would go and knowing it wouldn't be the last time he'd hear one. Instead, he merely listened and drove on. It was best, he knew, to let things play out on their own until they arrived. Turning again to TJ, Charlie spoke. If your death led to change, would you consider it worthwhile? Change? Like, this not happening to anyone else? Well, I guess then, yeah, TJ replied. And if it feeds a broader shift of change that takes time, still worth it? I mean, sure. TJ was confused. You had to die as you did, and as it was your fate from the beginning. Not like in that fancy way where people think we're all destined to become something great, but more than that, there was never any change in any of it. The fates decide for themselves what comes, all things working in the way they had to, so that the things which need to come later can. We're all factors in this grand equation. It doesn't always turn out like we'd like it to, but it always turns out the way it needed to. How the fuck you figured that? I needed to get shot by the police? How many need to get shot for things to change, huh? TJ was now growing more agitated, feeling once again that this whole life of his and now his death were being regarded as trivial by yet another old white man. People tend to think of destiny as some destination or a final point where everything makes sense. In truth, the merciless bitch that is fate, and frankly, she'd be a bit cross with me if she heard me say that, is less of an endpoint and more of an equation. An ongoing series of events playing themselves out in a simultaneous constant. It's... Charlie stopped, realizing rather quickly that he was running the risk of being indulgent in his explanation rather than helpful or enlightening. He, in truth, was no more accustomed to taking this ride than any of the others. Think of it like this. Every moment, every single moment, is the sum result of all the moments which came before. A temporary pinnacle event that was ordained to happen, both by all that which came before and all that which required that moment in order for those which are coming to happen. Does that make sense? TJ mulled the older man's words over, finding some measure of comfort in them, while still feeling resentful over the hand he was dealt. I guess so, yeah. 
So you're saying there was no change in what happened? Like, it couldn't have gone down any different? I'm afraid not. Same goes for all of us. So, will it really make anything change? I mean, will people finally stand up to do something? Or am I just a statistic? I can promise you that your death will not have been in vain. This, you'll see when we get where we're going. Where are we going? Do you know where we're headed? We all do now. But knowing more and more the closer we get, you just need to listen, Dan responded. Just listen. The four rode in silence each listening to their preferred music through the communal speakers in the bus which hurtled through the darkness, approaching their final destination. A sense of peace came over the three latter passengers, and each seemed to guarantee to relax in their seats, staring off into nothing, deep in thought. Only Charlie seemed to still be looking about and observing the trip, himself looking even younger than before, near the Garen's age appearing to be a man in his mid-thirties. His beard was full and black and trimmed. His hair was likewise an orderly onyx. He had been restored somehow. As they drove, the darkness above parted and a brilliant full moon shone down on the world around them, illuminating the haunting spindly branches of trees reaching out from the darkness on either side. Soon, Garen looked ahead to see a turn in the road which led to a large bridge, which even in the darkness, he could tell, was an oxidized green beneath the stark white moonlight. We're here, he said over his shoulder to his passengers, all of whom save Charlie, craned their necks to see where they had arrived. Here we go. As he turned onto the large steel bridge spanning over a deep river valley, calm and understanding came over each of the passengers. They were essentially home. A sense of a long journey now over overcame them all, and a sense of peace settled into their minds. All was silent as the bus crept along the long dark bridge, and soon they came to a stop at the other side. Pulling open the passenger door to let his fares off, Garen looked out to see a wall of impenetrable fog covering everything some twenty or thirty feet from the edge of the bridge. One by one, they rose and slowly shuffled off the bus. As he stepped off, TJ offered Garen a solemn look and a nod of his head, conveying his grim thanks for the ride. Dan followed next, letting his smirk split into a full smile as he clapped Garen on the shoulder. Thanks, Chief. Maybe I'll see you around, he said. Garen only nodded as he stepped off and began striding towards the fog. Behind him, waiting, stood Courtney. She looked up to her ferryman with eyes that conveyed equal part sadness and peace. Thank you, Mr. Garen. When you see my parents, can you let them know I'm okay? She asked. Of course I will. And don't worry, as they'll be along in what feels like the blink of an eye. Shooting him off the heartwarming smile of a child in the grips of safety and wonder, she nodded and stepped off. Last to leave was Charlie. He looked nothing like he had when Garen had picked him up. You look good for someone your age, Garen said knowingly. A retirement gift. Who wants to spend eternity as a broken old man? Now, you probably already know that I can't move on and retire unless you accept this task and title willingly. There have been many, many people who came this far only to wish to return to the world living as a mortal. If you accept this, you will live to see ages rise and fall. You will meet everyone who lives now and all who are to come. But beyond that, you will serve one of the most important roles in the mortal universe, Charlie instructed. Do you understand? 
I think so, Garen replied. What is my name? Well, it's Charlie. No, thank God I... What is my name? Charlie asked seriously. Garen paused. He knew the answer. He couldn't quite grasp it just yet, but he knew, he knew it and knew it would come to him if only he spoke it aloud. Ch... Ch... Oh, that's it, he almost stammered. After a moment's pause, he spoke again. Charon? You were Charon, the ferryman of the River Styx. You ferry the dead into the afterlife. Bingo. And what is your name now? Garen paused again. I... I am Charon. Charlie smiled broadly. boy. Wait, Garen interjected. Did you pick me because my name rhymes with yours? Charlie thought a moment and chuckled. You know? No. But... I'll chalk that up as an added bonus. Honestly, that hadn't even occurred to me. Yeah, funny the things that slip by. Clasping Garen's shoulder in his surprisingly strong hand, he looked him sincerely in the eyes. Best of luck to you, Charon. Perhaps one day, if you should decide to retire yourself, we'll meet up again. Out there, he said, gesturing to the fog. Until then, safe travels. Remember to be kind. At the end of it all, they get to see things the way they really are. It tends to be their biggest lesson. They don't always react well, so try not to judge, Charlie said, stepping finally off the bus. I will. So long, Charon. Goodbye for now, Charon. Charlie replied after a pause. Then, turning toward the fog, he strode toward the void and, sparing a final look over his shoulder, chuckled as he walked into the nothingness. Jaron closed the door and returned to his seat. He could feel there were fares awaiting him, and a great deal of work to do. Shifting the bus into drive once more, he pulled a U-turn and headed back across the bridge to the land of the living. Charon sang to himself as he sat out back across the bridge. He had a great deal of work to do, a real purpose, a meaning to his existence. Time may not have mattered the same to him now, but he had labor to attend to and passengers to see off to the other side. Important work. And so he sang those ancient words of Seculus. So long as you live, shine. Let nothing grieve you beyond measure, for your life is short, and time will claim its toll. Looking to Courtney, TJ saw an abject terror cross her face as tears collected in her eyes. Shit, he said. I'm sorry. No, it's okay, Courtney replied, her fear settling into understanding. I... I think I remember now, too. I was in bed. As she spoke, flashes of a hospital room and her parents standing above her, tears brimming their eyes, and her mother repeatedly covering her eyes and wailing in sadness flooded her mind. It took a moment for all the moments leading to her final one to settle into a discernible story that she could understand. But as it did... Courtney relaxed a bit and then began crying. I died, didn't I? She asked, looking up at Charlie. I'm afraid you did, kid. I'm really sorry, he replied with another pat on her shoulder. Courtney struggled with her tears, snorting and sniffling until finally she was able to speak again. We all died, didn't we? She asked. Dan nodded. Yeah, sadly. All but him. 
he said, pointing up to Garen, who remained steadfast in his driving duties, eyes peeled to the road ahead of him. Garen thought that he should respond, but remained silent, preferring to listen as he somehow knew how the conversation would go, and knowing it wouldn't be the last time he'd hear one. Instead, he merely listened and drove on. It was best, he knew, to let things play out on their own until they arrived. Turning again to TJ, Charlie spoke. If your death led to change, would you consider it worthwhile? Change? Like this not happening to anyone else? Well, I guess then, yeah, TJ replied. And if it feeds a broader shift of change that takes time, still worth it? I mean... Sure? TJ was confused. You had to die as you did, and as it was your fate from the beginning. Not like in that fancy way where people think we're all destined to become something great, but more than that. There was never any change in any of it. The fates decide for themselves what comes. All things working in the way they had to so that the things which need to come later can. We're all factors in this grand equation. It doesn't always turn out like we'd like it to, but it always turns out the way it needed to. How the fuck you figured that? I needed to get shot by the police? How many need to get shot for things to change, huh? TJ was now growing more agitated, feeling once again that this whole life of his, and now his death, were being regarded as trivial by yet another old white man. People tend to think of destiny as some destination or a final point where everything makes sense. In truth, the merciless bitch that is fate, and frankly, she'd be a bit cross with me if she heard me say that, is less of an end point and more of an equation. An ongoing series of events playing themselves out in a simultaneous constant. It's... Charlie stopped, realizing rather quickly that he was running the risk of being indulgent in his explanation rather than helpful and lightning. He, in truth, was no more accustomed to taking this ride than any of the others. Think of it like this. Every moment, every single moment, is the sum result of all the moments which came before. A temporary pinnacle event that was ordained to happen, both by all that which came before and all that which required that moment in order for those which are coming to happen. Does that make sense? TJ mulled the older man's words over, finding some measure of comfort in them, while still feeling resentful over the hand he was dealt. I guess so, yeah. So you're saying there was no change in what happened? Like, it couldn't have gone down any different? I'm afraid not. Same goes for all of us. So, will it really make anything change? I mean, will people finally stand up to do something? Or am I just a statistic? I can promise you that your death will not have been in vain. This you'll see when we get where we're going. Where are we going? Do you know where we're headed? We all do now. But knowing more and more the closer we get, you just need to listen, Dan responded. Just listen. The four rode in silence each listening to their preferred music through the communal speakers in the bus which hurtled through the darkness, approaching their final destination. A sense of peace came over the three latter passengers, and each seemed to Garen to relax in their seats, staring off into nothing, deep in thought. Only Charlie seemed to still be looking about and observing the trip, himself looking even younger than before, near the Garen's age appearing to be a man in his mid-thirties. His beard was full and black and trimmed. His hair 
was likewise an orderly onyx. He had been restored somehow. As they drove, the darkness above parted and a brilliant full moon shone down on the world around them, illuminating the haunting spindly branches of trees reaching out from the darkness on either side. Soon, Garin looked ahead to see a turn in the road which led to a large bridge, which even in the darkness, he could tell, was an oxidized green beneath the stark white moonlight. We're here he said over his shoulder to his passengers, all of whom save Charlie craned their necks to see where they had arrived. Here we go. As he turned onto the large steel bridge spanning over a deep river valley, a calm and understanding came over each of the passengers. They were essentially home. A sense of a long journey now over overcame them all and a sense of peace settled into their minds. All was silent as the bus crept along the long, dark bridge, and soon they came to a stop at the other side. Pulling open the passenger door to let his fares off, Garin looked out to see a wall of impenetrable fog covering everything some twenty or thirty feet from the edge of the bridge. One by one, they rose and slowly shuffled off the bus. As he stepped off, TJ offered Garen a solemn look and a nod of his head, conveying his grim thanks for the ride. Dan followed next, letting his smirk split into a full smile as he clapped Garen on the shoulder. Thanks, Chief. Maybe I'll see you around, he said. Garen only nodded as he stepped off and began striding towards the farm. Behind him, waiting, stood Courtney. She looked up to her ferryman with eyes that conveyed equal part sadness and peace. Thank you, Mr. Garen. When you see my parents, can you let them know I'm okay? She asked. Of course I will. And don't worry, as they'll be along in what feels like the blink of an eye. Shooting him off the heartwarming smile of a child in the grips of safety and wonder. She nodded and stepped off. Last to leave was Charlie. He looked nothing like he had when Garen had picked him up. You look good for someone your age, Garen said knowingly. A retirement gift. Who wants to spend eternity as a broken old man? Now, you probably already know that I can't move on and retire unless you accept this task and title willingly. There have been many, many people who came this far only to wish to return to the world living as a mortal. If you accept this, you will live to see ages rise and fall. You will meet everyone who lives now and all who are to come. But beyond that, you will serve one of the most important roles in the mortal universe, Charlie instructed. Do you understand? I think so. Garen replied. What is my name? Well, it's Charlie. No, think on it. What is my name? Charlie asked seriously. Garen paused. He knew the answer. He couldn't quite grasp it just yet, but he knew, he knew it, and knew it would come to him if only he spoke it aloud. Ch- Cha Oh, that's it, he almost stammered. After a moment's pause, he spoke again. Charon? You were Charon, the ferryman of the River Styx. We ferry the dead into the afterlife. Bingo. And what is your name now? Garen paused again. I... I am Charon. Charlie smiled broadly. boy. Wait, Garen interjected. Did you pick me because my name rhymes with yours? Charlie thought a moment and chuckled. You know, no, but I'll chalk that up as an added bonus. Honestly, that hadn't even occurred to me. Funny the things that slipped by. 
clasping Garen's shoulder in his surprisingly strong hand, he looked him sincerely in the eyes. Best of luck to you, Charon. Perhaps one day, if you should decide to retire yourself, we'll meet up again. Out there, he said, gesturing to the fog. Until then, safe travels. Remember to be kind. At the end of it all, they get to see things the way they really are. It tends to be their biggest lesson. They don't always react well, so try not to judge, Charlie said, stepping finally off the bus. I will. So long, Sharon. Goodbye for now, Sharon, Charlie replied after a pause. Then, turning toward the fog, he strode toward the void and, sparing a final look over his shoulder, chuckled as he walked into the nothingness. Charon closed the door and returned to his seat. He could feel there were fares awaiting him, and a great deal of work to do. Shifting the bus into drive once more, he pulled a U-turn and headed back across the bridge to the land of the living. Charon sang to himself as he sat out back across the bridge. He had a great deal of work to do, a real purpose, a meaning to his existence. Time may not have mattered the same to him now, but he had labor to attend to and passengers to see off to the other side. Important work. And so he sang those ancient words of Seculos. So long as you live, shine. Let nothing grieve you beyond measure. For your life is short, and time will claim its toll.